You can shear a sheep several times, but you can only skin it once, right? But yeah, I think I think as a contractor too, when you're going into an area, unless you have just a ginormous crew, you have to decide, am I going after that neighborhood where we're just gonna go bing, 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 and just knock a bunch of these out and try to get everyone in that neighborhood? Or am I going after the big houses? You can make a ton of money either way. You know, there's like, a guy that has like a tree through his roof and and is sleeping on the couch. And he's like, you know, when you get to it, that'll be fine. And then this customer <laughs> has like woolen baseboards or something, right? And they're like, oh my God, this is such, you know, Sweet I don't, right. when is this going to be taken care of? You know, and it's like, man, you have no perspective, you know, to what your neighbors are dealing with. I think you should talk about that beforehand, right? Are you going to go after the the bing, bing, bing neighborhoods, or are you gonna go after the high volume neighborhoods? And yeah. it's not a right or wrong, it's just a different strategy. My name is John Isaacson, and this is my first time being on a podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, you, can you hear me? Uh, I'm John Isaacson, uh, the Diojo podcast, the Intentional Restorer, and we hate adjusters. Yeah. <laughs> so um, no, we know it. Uh, we know it. Yeah, we're just, uh, we make our, our living grinding at the bones of adjusters and, and drinking their blood. And so thank you for having me on. Um, what is this podcast about again? <laughs> My podcast or yours? No, yeah, I don't. Uh, probably <laughs> mine. I, you're very clear in your messaging and, and like we were talking about off camera, I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm taking notes on um, just your production value and how you um, introduce videos and everything. So you really got uh, a really good uh, vibe. You know, it, it flows. The, the information is really um, valuable. So hopefully I can bring that to the table. Um, I'm obviously on the other side. We're... Uh, restoration contractor. I answered an ad back in 2002, I think, for a carpet cleaning for a service master in Ventura, California. And at that time, it was the tail end of mold is gold era. And um, and so the, the owner of that franchise said, you know, um, with your background in science, you'd be really good at mold remediation. And I said, yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> and so started a whole uh discovered an industry i didn't know even i didn't even know existed so yeah did you did you set out to get into insurance were, were you you know young matthew in high school and and you were like man i really want to get into insurance it is there exciting. anyone literally <laughs> anyone in the world who is like in elementary like junior high or high school who's like and what do you want to be when you grow up, Johnny? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've met one person. Apparently there was a insurance college like in um, it's it's uh, it's uh, west of Salem, Oregon. There was this insurance college. And so the obviously the guy's dad was in insurance and, and he saw the value of it. And that's so, I've met one person in what, 20 years that have said, yeah, I set out to be in insurance and 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 uh, went to school for it and did all the things. So <laughs> yeah, it's not common, but it's a great career. I mean, I, so I started off. I was in. I got my degree in radio and television broadcasting, and oh, um, worked in that field for um, probably seven years seven or eight wow. years, something like that. And I mean, I did all kinds of freelance stuff. I did uh, freelance sports production for ESPN and ABC, like, you know, wow. running cameras or, you know, doing the, yeah. the behind the scenes stuff. Um, I worked at um, an NBC affiliate um, for a little while at the news station, a like a local, it was like a top 20 market, but it was, and I, I learned a lot about news that, you know, it's, yeah. you see this, how the sausage is made. You don't want to eat the sausage. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I w actually was the last thing I did, which is kind of overlapped with the cur the claim stuff was I was um, working at the Food Network as an associate producer, okay. um, which was a really, really fun job, but didn't pay anything. Sure. Because, you know, 
it's, it's one of those deals. If you try to go into the executive producer's office and ask for a raise, he'll just turn to the stack of resumes that he just got on his desk five minutes ago that came from the mailroom for people who will work for free, you know, yeah. to do the same work. So, Break yeah, in. so it's yeah. more of those kind of jobs. I mean, but, you know, and I heard about the claims thing from my sister, strangely enough, because she was friends with a guy who went out and did uh, ran hail claims all summer. And then he oh, okay. like they lived in they lived in Nashville and he was trying to be a recording artist. And so he'd spend the winter get going on gigs and trying to, you know, nail get down record deals and all that kind of stuff. And uh and then go work and run claims all summer long. And he actually owns NIA firm now. <laughs> so wow. So he transitioned away from music. I transitioned away from video and TV, but then I transitioned back to it. So um Yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I, and when I heard about it, I was like, that sounds like complete baloney. I mean, you can't, be <laughs> I mean, I've never heard, if I've never heard of it, then it can't be real. And I mean, if right. nobody hears, has, hears about this kind of work, I mean, it's the storm chasing thing all summer long. Yep. It's like, it's such a, I mean, even on the contracting side, I think it's a very small little yeah. community. And I'll oh, even yeah. see, you know, like I, over the years, I've run into guys that I ran into you know, I'll be up in Minneapolis and I'll run into somebody that I was on a Nebraska storm or a St. Louis storm or a Dallas storm. Hey, what's yep. going on, man? I thought I recognized your truck. You know, it's, yeah, you, yeah. You know, so I don't know when I talk, when I talk about contractors, I always, these, Who you hate, right? You hate I hate them. I well, in the beginning, it's like, so here's the, the, the thing <laughs> is, and you could probably speak to this a little bit is that when you're first starting and you're unsure of your, abilities, like my abilities to, to write an estimate, to sure. know what I'm looking at, right. When I, when I walk into a, look at a house or inside or whatever to, to, to scope it correctly, which is going to inform how good my estimate is. I'm, I have some insecurity about that as a, as a brand spanking new person, unless I was like a general contractor or a restoration contractor. And I've written a bunch of estimates before, um, homeowners, yeah. If you're if you're going through their estimate and you're like unsure about it, then it's blood in the water. They immediately don't believe you, right? Which I learned. Yeah. Contractors, if they sense for a second that you don't know what you're doing, then it's blood in the water, and they're going to tear you to pieces, right? Um, and they're going to they'll team up with the homeowner, and then you're it's it's a reinspection. Your manager's getting involved or whatever, you know. So it becomes a so yeah. so you, pe people are adjust, new adjusters get nervous because they may have had like a couple of bad experiences when they get started because some adjust, some contractor tore them to pieces or fought with them or, you know, yeah. or, they, or they went on yeah. an event where there was like, you know, going to Minneapolis, if you've ever worked there, I mean, they get pea sized hail and every con contractor in the entire country is in Minneapolis. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, you'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. And Paysetter is bringing training to a city near you. Check out their summer tour dates at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter because they have yeah. matching, right? It's, it, they have to match everything. Yep. And so it's, and the prices are like Florida prices. You know, you can go to Milwaukee and have like, you know, what, $190 a square, 225 a square. Yeah. And then you go over to Minneapolis and it's like $600 a square for composition right. or whatever, you know? So it's, there's a lot of, they're, they're, they're drawn in there and they'll fight you on everything. So if your first storm was, one of those events, then, yeah. you know, then you've got this bad attitude about contractors. And I found, you know, my first storm was in Chicago and I was running into to guys who were very experienced, very, very aggressive. And if, when I didn't know a whole lot, they would 
mop the floor with me pretty much. I mean, for all intents and purposes, <laughs> but the thing was, is I learned that, you know, you, you get a lot of anxiety when you pull up to a, an insurance house and there's like three pickup trucks there and they're lifted yep. and they've got, you know, contractor graphics all over yeah. them, a bunch of dudes in the front yard and the homeowners <laughs> standing there like this. And there's a bunch of guys, you know, like, well, we're going to take care of you and this insurance company and blah, blah, blah. That, that look at it, this guy. Look at this guy. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> that used to be like a very, very stressful, like high anxiety situation. And I think for a lot of adjusters, even experienced adjusters, it is. But I decided one day I was going to one, I knew a contractor was going to be there and I knew it was somebody that I'd kind of like butted heads with a little bit. I said in my mind, I was like, you know what, this one's in the, on the fringe. It's kind of out just, you know, the edge of the storm. It's, it's hot and heavy in here. Everybody's getting a new roof, but out here it's kind of hit and miss. These guys are, they're working the hit and miss area to try to drum up some, you know, to, to get some roofs going so that, that the adjuster's yeah. like, well, I guess if those guys are getting one, I'll just pay for this one too. Um, and I said, you know what? In my mind, I was like, there could be damage there. Yeah. Who, who am I to say, you know, why am I going to second guess this when I owe the insured uh, full inspection and to give them the complete benefit of the doubt. Yeah. And yep. that like that one thing, like completely changed my attitude about meeting with contractors because I was, because at that point I walked up, teased him a little bit about his like lifted pickup truck, you know, well, Hey, you know, if, if I need any buses to jump on the who to call, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> and, know. you know, winked at the guy, shook his hand and said, all right, let's, let's take a look at this one, see what we can do. Right. And um, <laughs> immediately, like everything was like completely like, yeah, just the whole stress level just drops out of it. The, the customer's like, okay, all right, well, it looks like they're smiling. I mean, that's, that's good, right? You know, and you get up yeah. on the roof, you don't find damage. And I'll, I'll say to the contractor, I'll say, you know, listen, man, I don't think we, you know, I'm not really seeing a whole lot on this one. I think we can pay for it. I can take a good picture of. Um, have you been over to Greystone? Oh, oh no, where's that? Yeah. Well, it's this other neighborhood, you know, it, it's uh, I've, I've been over there a bunch and they, I think they got a lot yeah. more damage over there. I've totaled every roof yeah, I've been on in that neighborhood. Yeah. And I haven't seen anybody else in there. I, there's no roofer signs in yards or anything like that. You guys might check that out. And I'm like, hold yeah. my phone and like, well, so, well, where's that again? Can you text me a screenshot? You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And that guy like, <laughs> well, thanks. I really appreciate it, man. No worries. And then the next time I run into that guy, it's instead yeah. of like, you know, this one's totaled. It's, Hey, listen, you know, uh, this one was kind of borderline. We just wanted to see what you thought. Um, so you take yeah. a look at whatever you say we're cool with. And I'm, I'm running into that guy all summer. I might meet him in next summer, you know, five states yeah. over. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind yeah. of, as far as like dealing with contractors, that one thing, and I, I feel like it it made the, the customer uh, more relaxed, it made the carrier happy because, you know, I'm, I always try to meet with the contractor no matter what, because I want to get an agreed scope and pricing right there. Contract or the yeah. carrier loves that. Um, but any advice that you can give to adjusters who are, you know, nervous, maybe they're at the beginning of their careers yeah. dealing with the uh, contractors. Well, I think you're, you're, you're touching on the, the bravado, right? The, uh, the false sense of like, uh, you know, we have to be something if, if you're truly going to be a man. Right. And so, um, it was funny. I've, I've never, ever uh, been or espouted to be a tough guy. So when I started in the industry, we had some tough dudes that worked on our crew and, um, you know, people that had done some time and, you know, those kinds of things. Like, right on. And I remember I walked in because I'd been in construction all my life. My uncle was a contractor. So I grew up around construction, you know, tough and getting sworn and yelled at and whatever. Right. Um, and, uh, but, uh, I remember they were saying, um, one of the guys was like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to beat you up, you know, and obviously I'm editing <laughs> the, the terminology. And I remember just thinking, um, I didn't believe him. Like, I didn't think he actually meant that. And I was like, well, we better go behind the dumpster. So at least it's not on camera, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and then from that day forward, I never really got messed with again. And so I think you're talking about the same thing, right? Like just, yeah. you got to find some way to be who you are. So, you know, if you're the tough guy and you want to fight everybody, 
you know, whether that's physically or on paper, uh, have at it, you know, I don't think that's a fun way to live life, you know, <laughs> no, and exactly no. like you said, like throw it at them. Um, you know, take, 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 uh, take the, like you said, the truck, like, yeah, I can jump over buses. You know, it's a, it's a backhanded funny compliment. Right. So, yeah. um, uh, the other thing I think we always tried to train our crews a lot of times when, 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 uh, work would spike, um, the one thing I always told, uh, people, new employees, temp employees, whatever it was, was I never want to hear you say, I don't know. And yeah. so, but the flip side of that is I don't want you uh, pretending you know something that you don't. So I think most people, my experience has been if somebody asks you a really good question, you know, if you just start just pulling stuff out of the back pocket, right, and just spouting off things that could potentially really get you in trouble, right, if they, yeah. if they hold you to your words, don't say stuff that you don't know, especially as a new adjuster, right? Just say, Hey, that's a great question. Um, I'm here to document the, uh, the conditions of the loss. And I think that's, and, and, and I will research that question. I'll get back to you. And so, yeah. and there's two parts of that is never say, I don't know, but maintain trust by telling them your question is very valid. I will get back to you within 48 hours, you know, or whatever your timeline is going to be. And then answer them with something really valid. The other part of that is that now gives you no one should ever be able to ask you that question again without knowing the answer, right? You now right. know you've added that to your resource bank. And so, um, and I think that's the other part is what's important, and you touched on it too, for contractors and adjusters, is we're 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 not interpreting you know, the, the loss, we're allowing the loss to reveal itself, right? What was the source? Yeah. What is the extent? And so, and so I always try to tell, I try to set the expectation early and often. I, I don't know why there are some contractors and some adjusters, you know, they're like, yeah, we're going to get, we're going to get everything out of this, you know? And it's like, that's not, that's not the game you want to play. Cause that will bite you in the butt, you know? Um, Cause if, if, if you're that way as a contractor with the insurance company, the customer is going to be that way with you, right? You know, let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's make this happen. Right. And so, you know, I always try to tell, you know, insurance, which you said your, your job is to make them whole. Our job is try to, to interpret and pr not interpret, but present the story of this structure, the damage of this structure, through the program, which is typically Xactimate, to the insurance company using photos, detailed line items, F9 notes, you know, and that's a uh, Xactimate's great for real basic stuff, but when it falls outside of the norm, that's when you have to say, okay, I'm trying to use this line item to communicate yeah, this, yeah. or this is why I'm using labor or whatever. And so, but explaining to the customer, our job here. And just like you did with the, the the contractor is I'm the adjuster. I'm here representing the insurance company. Our job is to make you whole, to restore you to pre-loss conditions, no more and no less, right? You're not to profit from this and, and we're not to shortchange you. And so that's my job is to try to figure out what is it going to take given, you know, the valuable input from this esteemed contractor with his, you know, turbo lifted <laughs> diesel. <laughs> Yeah, uh, right. And he's, you, can see, you can see from his trunk bed, he's never hauled anything in the day of his life, yeah. you know. So. Sounds like a space shuttle <laughs> taking off when he drives away. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, yeah. So that's what I would just say, exactly like you talked about, have some confidence, you know, you're there to serve the structure, right? The contractor should be there to serve the structure. The homeowner needs to understand everybody's here to try to interpret what is right for the structure, what's covered, you know, what's to be repaired. You know, our job as a contractor is if there's something kind of out of the norm that maybe wouldn't normally be something that an adjuster would know, then to communicate that effectively, you know, through photos, explaining what needs to happen, you know, those kinds of things. And then, so I think contractors also do themselves a disservice when they kind of drum it up or, you know, um, cause it is true exactly. Like you said, an adjuster can be a great source for future work or, 
um, you know, it's such a small world. You're going to run into that person again, you know? So I always say, you know, never, uh, never burn a bridge if you have to, but you know, if it really gets to the point, I mean, torch that sucker, you know, (laughs) (laughs) right on. Um, so so I, one thing I think that, that a lot of adjusters, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but I, I I think it comes up every now and then where people will say, well, you know, especially if they've, they've gone on cat and they've, they've met with a bunch of different contractors, especially on a hailstorm sure. where you're always, you're going to meet with a lot of contractors. They'll, they, maybe they'll wonder, you know, well, um, maybe I should go to the, to the contracting side, you know, oh, man. Is it better. Yeah, yeah. Is it, which one's better? Which ones, you know, is it pay and the work and whatever. So what are your thoughts on, uh, on well, sort of the flip side, right? oh, you yeah. investors make all the money, right? And it's your, your job is cush. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters with scoper writer programs popping up all over the place. You can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. The thing, most often, and I talk a lot about th- this with um, other contractors that we consult with, is um, they think, I hire you, Matthew, right? You know all the insurance companies. You know how to write a scope, da 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 That's like such a small portion of what happens in a restoration company, right? Because you get to write the estimate, then walk away for all intents and purposes. If there's supplements or something significant that changes, you might become reengaged. Whereas we, we now take, you know, from the exact mid estimate, we're putting a budget together. We've got the production plan, the components, we're trying to buy things, confirm the value, you know, especially in a storm situation, you know, the OSB plywood is now four times the price of what it was in exact when we wrote the estimate. So now we've got to prove that to the insurance company, those kinds of things. Plus right. the customer now wants to upgrade, you know, their house was green and they want it to be purple. And you have to explain well, that's going to take, you know, double the amount of paint, you know, because of the colors that you chose and, and all those kinds of things. So it, it's doable. I mean, adjusters have the other side of that is we're all if you use Xactimate, it's more about compliance than it is about estimating in a lot of ways. Right. You're writing. You understand the insurance company, their compliance issues and how they like to see it presented Whereas uh, on the contracting side, we have to figure out the line items that get us to where we need to be to match market value and then play all those um, nuances. And so um, it's, it's a lot more involved, you know, um, uh, and I, I, I've rarely personally, I'm not saying that as a knock on any adjusters, I haven't seen it work very often just because it is so different right yeah. and and vice versa i don't see very many contractors crossing over and them having you know a great time with it you know it's just two different modes you know i really is i and i think uh um one thing that i think adjusters don't don't understand or they don't maybe don't think about um is that especially if they're if they're meeting with a, a 
you know, roof salesman or, or whoever it is, restoration contractor. And that person seems to be a little bit on edge and they're really kind of being pushy and maybe a little bit aggressive. The thing about it is, is that if they don't get that job, I mean, if, if, if it's not approved, then they don't get it. If Even if it is approved, they still have to win the job. They still got to get the signed contract. Yeah. Yep. They don't get paid yep. just for showing up. Um, right. So the, the guy, you know, he's as the as an independent adjuster, like it doesn't matter to me if there's zero damage or all the damage, I'm still going to get paid for being there. And, right. and the more damage, I mean, the more damage we find, obviously, I mean, we're, we're getting paid more if we're on fee schedule. Um, yep. And then, and then, like you said, I mean, the adjusters don't understand also that, that a lot of the time, if you want to get that whole commission as a, as a roof salesperson, you got to manage the job, right? This, so that means you're not yeah. just making phone calls back and forth to the homeowner. You're calling suppliers, you're calling your, you know, you're getting with the foremans, you know, with the crews and it's yeah. like, then you have to schedule everything with everybody's, it's a lot of work. And then yeah. you don't like, I, I know a lot of contractors. I mean, some people won't get paid until, they get the final RCV check and they won't get their commission yep. until then. And that could be yep. months from now. Um, so, you know, not to say that it's a you know big, sad story for contractors because you guys can do really well, especially if you're good. But I think, you yeah. know, having a, a, a bigger picture view of like what that job, your job really looks like compared to ours, it's not apples and apples for sure. Like you said, yeah. it's, it's, re it's really two different things. And I have a lot of, a lot of times I'll have contractors when I get up on roofs with them, you know, guy, you can tell he's, he maybe he's kind of new or he's a little unsure or whatever. He's like, well, how do I, how can I go do what you do? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to adjustertv.com. Yeah. Or maybe he just got, yeah, he's underperforming or, well, it's the same, like auto adjusters think, oh, I could do property. The the dollar value is so much bigger or whatever, or, you know, the plumber thinks they can get into mitigation or the right. GC thinks they can do their own roofing company. And it's, you know, everybody thinks everybody else has it so much better. And you realize everything has its um, pluses. There's no easy job, you know, I mean, everything's hard. It's uh Cause too, I mean, you guys have the volume pressure. I've got another buddy that's, uh, he started out in cat and now he's doing local claims and the same things we have to do as far as pushing buttons and compliance and remembering, Oh yeah, they like it this way. And this insurance company likes it that way. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, we're all part of the same, uh, system, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, slaves to the same system. So yeah. And, uh, you know, it may be that somebody who's an adjuster might be better suited to being doing in sales or, sure. being, you know, doing restoration stuff for sure. I mean, there's, it's, it's, uh, like you said, it's a different beast. Um, yeah. Kind of sort of on that same vein. Um, I think <clears throat> that, and I think this has been kind of the case as long as I've been an adjuster, um, we have a little bit of a deficit on our side as far as knowing like understanding the, the the full processes involved with doing a restoration, particular restoration job, for example, you know, siding, like if we're going to replace an elevation of siding, it's got, there's a couple of offsets and bump outs and things like that and windows with window wrap. And then there's trim and corners and inside corners. Um, yeah. A lot of adjusters don't know how a lot of those things go together. Like they may not understand what's, you know, directly above the drywall in the room that they're sitting in you know, without yeah. going up there and looking, um, or even how it right. all goes together. Do you have any advice or tips for people to, to get their brains wrapped around restoration construction and not just like new construction or like handyman stuff that you see on YouTube, but like real, like yeah. restoration construction, like how can people learn that? A good friend of mine is an independent adjuster in Oregon, Kirk uh, Matthews. We had him an, on our podcast and he said the same. He's like, especially if you get that contractor that you have a relationship with, it's going to be hard to do because you got timelines and everything. But if you can get out and see one of the losses that you estimated in progress, if you're a cat adjuster, that's probably going to be harder to do, you know, um, uh, you know, as far as, but if you do day claims, you know, something locally, try to get out there and see, um, cause it is different. I mean, it's so much different, you know, when you're actually out there and you're doing the work, um, you know, and, and upon discovery. So there, there's no, there's no, uh, substitute for actually getting out there, um, 
you know, and you may have to volunteer one of your weekends or a Saturday or something to go take a peek, but um, that's a good way to do it. Watching the building shows. I think those are probably, you know, uh, uh, my wife loves watching those. And I think they're probably one of the most detrimental to our industry because now people think, you know, well, you should be able to tile, put the cabinets in, paint the house and have the laundry room done, you know, in three days. They do it on 45 minutes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, I, you know, especially one, you know, for anybody listening, when they lay the tile, grout it and seal it all in the same day, um, there's going to be issues. You know, that's not following manufacturer's instructions, you know. Um, So those each of those need at least 24 to 40 out cure. 48 hours cure time in between those processes. So, right. um, so yeah, uh, they just must have magic grout or something. So TV grout. Uh, getting out there, getting out there and, and seeing something in progress, you know, if you have a contractor, they have a good relationship with, you know, maybe try to go, you know, see one of the projects if you can. Okay. Um, and then let's talk about kind of the value of, of uh, estimating Using software, using Xactimate. Um, I think that, sure. you know, just as a little bit of a preamble, I we I think we recognize on our side that probably the biggest bottleneck for us, for our cycle times and for, you know, having the claims reopen is going to be proficiency in Xactimate, right? Can you kind of speak yeah. to that a little bit? Yeah, the the book I wrote, <laughs> Be Intentional Estimating, the most mediocre book there is on the market about estimating with Xactimate. Um, it's more about developing the right mindset and habits, you know, so it's not a how-to. I noticed I looked up um, Xactimate beginner uh, videos, and you guys have quite a few. Um, I know um, even Chris Stanley, you know, who we've had on our podcast, IA Path, um, I mean, and, and your adjuster TV, man, that's a, that's quite a database. So I would say if somebody wants to know where to start, you guys have an excellent, um, you know, library. So this is more mindset and habits. Like if somebody wants to learn how to estimate and get into, uh, we had Alex Bogoyevich, she's up in Canada and that was, she was doing service. She wanted to get into estimating. So someone like that, where you want to advance your career, the book kind of helps give you some of those mindset and habits that'll help you develop um, into that role. And then also um, if you're someone that's training others, um, but there's, it's, it's funny because a lot of the courses you can take just like college, right? It prepares you for some of the concepts, but it doesn't always prepare you for what's going to happen in the real world. Right. So, you know, being able to have people that you can reach out to, videos that you can refer to, you know, reference pieces and those kinds of things. And then, you know, your own, build your own network of, of other professionals that are dealing with the same things is really helpful. I know you mentioned, um, you know, sometimes people go online, you know, some of the social media things and then try to ask questions and sometimes get their teeth kicked in. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm just yeah. asking a question, trying to, trying to get some help. And, uh, the same thing happens on our end. It's funny. So I guess we're not all that different adjusters and contractors, right? Cause we have some social media portals where sometimes people asking honest questions kind of get beat up, you know, or, or people that are learning along the way. I think that's the other important thing to remember. Like if you're a new adjuster, anybody that's gotten there, I'm I'm sure you feel the same way, Matthew, but I'm not smarter or better or more talented than anyone else. I've just made all the mistakes and learned from them, you know? And so there's really no substitute for trial and error or the school of hard knocks. But uh, man, if you can get around some people that are also trying to, step their game up and raise the bar. It'll, it'll encourage you, you know, um, you know, uh, hearing from people that have made some of those failures. And we talk about on our podcast, helping you shorten your dang learning curve, you know, so if you learn from others, um, that can maybe expedite your process to making more, being more efficient. Um, and that's like, you talked about being more efficient that a lot of what ours is, is just coming in with the same process, right? I'm going to, Every room, I'm going to, you know, photo the four corners of the room, detail photos of the losses. Uh, I'm always going to write top to bottom. Um, Some guys like to use or some uh, adjusters, estimators like to use macros. 
I'm a big fan of cut and paste, you know, oh, this loss is pretty similar to that other loss and with the same carrier. So I'm going to kind of, I'll do my sketch and then I'll cut and paste from that one. If you're an auto claims adjuster or appraiser, you already know that SCA is one of the top companies that you can work for on the auto side. But if you're a property adjuster who's never done any auto, you may have never even heard of SCA. We've heard of them now. SCA Claim Services is launching their property division and they're poised to bring their decades of claims management experience and extensive resources to the property side of things. Insurance carriers already trust SCA because they know they will always receive a high level of customer service and policyholder satisfaction. And with literally millions of claims handled in SCA's four decade history, carriers trust SCA to help them avoid unnecessary costs by handling every claim every time with unparalleled accuracy and a commitment to doing things the right way. I mean, these guys are old school, right? Since 1979, SCA has been exceeding expectations. Only a company dedicated to serving and taking care of people, including their adjusters, can a company like this continue to grow in this industry. Join the team with industry-leading NPS scores and cycle times that has the resources to bring new opportunities for not only auto adjusters, but now for property adjusters. To get started with SCA Claim Services, head on over to adjustertv.com slash SCA. And while you're there, don't forget to download the totally free SCA Claim Services Field Adjuster Gear Guide. Again, that's adjustertv.com slash SCA to download the free gear guide and to apply. I don't know, I'm sure you guys use, we've just started incorporating DocuSketch and that's a game changer, the 360 degree photos. Sure, yeah, yeah, um, I've seen those. And it'll do your your sketch for you. A lot of people use Matterport, and I know there's some other pieces out there. But I think it's more as you develop your game plan, just every loss you come to have a process to help um, so that you don't miss those items, you know, um, yeah. and have to. Because there's nothing worse than having to go back, right? So take gobs oh, and man. gobs of photos or the 360 degree or the video, you know, or all of the above and uh, take really good notes. Um, I'm more the school, come in photos, couple of notes, and uh, and then write it from the desk. I don't prefer to write, you know, on site. Um, so there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat, you know, but just develop your process, be consistent with it. And when you hear something from somebody and it makes sense, you know, incorporate that into your, how you do your thing. Yeah, for sure. And listen, I, I think that's that's really key um, either side. And honestly, with, I think with probably pretty much anything, you know, doing, yeah. trying to create a lot of content for adjuster TV and have a workflow for that so that I'm not, so I'm able to do more in less time. Yeah. Having a repeatable yeah. process, um, for writing estimates for when you, you know, your, your estimate is, is completely dependent on your scope. Right. And so if you're, if you're yeah. able to move around over and through a house, and any structures they have on the property and fence and contents in a pre, like you said, a predetermined order every single time, exactly the same way, your chances yep. of having errors show yep. up on your estimate are much diminished because yep. you're, you're not going to miss as damage as much. And for on the carrier side, on the adjusting side, I mean, people don't believe it. Insureds definitely don't believe it, but I can get more trouble for missing damage than I can for over for an overwrite, right? Mm -hmm. Because it creates more work for everybody because then now the insurer yep. is mad and you got to bring them back from the edge on top of everything yep. else, right? And then it may be in you know, a worst case scenario, if it goes to court, it could end up being way more than it should have been if you screwed yeah, it up yeah. in the beginning. So and it, when yeah. an adjuster has it has a good solid workflow that gets them around that property, and it like you said, it like it's the, the repeatable, um, consistent way every single time. And when you're working cat property, especially hail claims, I mean, you you can build those chops pretty fast because the yeah. claims are they're identical, especially if you're in the same neighborhood. Everybody's got the same 2600 square foot house. Over. Yeah, yep. and a little plastic play fort thing in the backyard and a deck with a grill on it and a grill yep. cover, you know, and all those things have damage. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other thing you, you mentioned, which I think is really critical and I'll, I'll add to it is, is that having mentors or like a, like a group of people that you, that you can reach out and kind of touch, even if they're at your same level or slightly above, um, yeah. 
or even, you know, having people in that group that are slightly above and slightly below oh, you guys, yeah. yep. you definitely can, you can help. Everybody can help everybody. And in teaching somebody who's below you, it's something yeah. that you figured out or you learned from the, the person who's above you, it, gr it grooves yeah. it in even better. And you might be like, oh yeah. Oh, you know, we could actually, you know, shave off five minutes by, I just saw that by yep. telling you, you know, um, yep. people, people, it's not, this is not a lone wolf kind of a job. You know, you, you're yeah. adjusters. I mean, we're, we're on a team, even as independents, even when we don't really feel like it, we're out in the field and the computer's sending us files, right? And we only hear from our yeah. manager if they're like, hey, you know, we're, we're out of files, you know, thanks for helping. Or they're like, you screwed up or come into the office or whatever. But that doesn't, that happens, doesn't happen as often the more experience you get. Um, but I, you know, I think if adjusters want to advance their career, like we were saying, they have to look beyond their next paycheck for sure. And they have to, so in other words, all these things that they do when they're we're working on their quality, they're working on their customer service and they're working on their um, cycle time, their speed, those things all have to be high and yeah. fighting with contractors does not help any of that stuff. I mean, it, it slows yeah. everything down. And that's one of the things I, sometimes I, when I, I'll meet with a roofing contractor or a restoration contractor on a hailstorm, I can't use a blanket term roofer, for everybody, you know, unless yeah. you're like doing water. Um, but some guys will be like, whatever you say, we'll, we'll do it for that. Right. And as long as it's reasonable, as long as they can do it for that, then they do it for yeah. that. Right. Um, and then yeah. other guys will fight tooth and nail to get extra money for hand nailing for, you know, yeah, well, yeah. we're going to interleave the valleys and we're going to, you know, we're going to spray paint it with gold leaf and we're going to, you know, it's the, yeah, yeah. so they add all this stuff on and then they, and then they, and then they're like, well, every claim is going to go to a supplement. And I know that there's like a, a business model for that, but at the same time, it's like, it seems to me like in my experience on the adjusting side, and you can speak to this a little bit on, on your side, but if I get assigned 60 claims and they're all in North St. Louis and they're all 1500 square foot, one story brick, yeah. straight gable, three twelves for Sorry, maybe a four twelve. So I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm crushing those claims. I mean, I'm, it's, it's going to yeah. be good for me because I can close a lot, lot, lot of claims, lot, lot. Yep. high yep. volume, right? If I get sent out to yep. the suburbs, and I've got a bunch of 5,000 square foot houses with 55 square foot roofs that are all cut up and, you know, facets everywhere and everything. Yeah. I'm doing three of those or four of those, maybe five of those a day, whereas I could do 10 of the other ones. And then, right. then there's a lot more, the contractors are all out there where all the fan, the, the big houses are because the crews, you know, they, they can do a roof in a day. They don't want to have to try and do a, a roof in two thirds of a day because then they got the rest of the day wasted. So right, they can't right. start another one. Um, so we like to, I like to work on volume myself. And I, when I've run into guys that are like, they really want to get the biggest possible job. I'm like, well, you know, at the end of the year, if I have 1200 claims closed, I mean, that's, that's a great income for me. You know, it may still, yeah. and I, and I didn't have yeah. to work as hard for it. Whereas if I, if right. I did 600 of these like bigger losses, it's the money, you know, the money might be similar, but I worked my butt off for those and got yelled and screamed at a bunch. And so I'm just curious, like on the contracting side, what you, you know, what you guys think about the volume versus the quality, the, the quantity versus quality. quality. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I talk about that in the book because I think that's part of uh, definitely for contractors and, and possibly for adjusters, but for contractors, when you're, when you're doing insurance work, you have to decide you know, there's the one extreme of TPA work where we've signed up for a program, we're on the Rolodex, we're going to get a claims. And, and a lot of that, it's a lot more, there's a lot more concessions. You've made concessions for volume, right? So you're playing more of the volume um, uh, quantity over quality game. And if you've decided to do that, and then you want to bitch about it, you know, there's something wrong with your process, right? You've signed up for it. You need to now learn to master it. Yeah. And then on the other extreme is um, the guys that uh, the companies that want to, like you said, just fight for every little penny um, and maybe to the extreme, you know, if it's a legitimate, sure, fight for it. But, um, you know, there's, I feel like 
I'm like more of a pragmatist. There's, there's a, I've done TP, I've done tons and tons of TPA work and tons of independent work. And, um, you know, you really have to decide, you know, what your strategy is going to be, um, overall. Um, and we do some estimating remotely for contractors. And that's always what I ask them when we're onboarding is, you know, well, what's your strategy? <laughs> you know, usually it's like, what are you talking about? You know? And so, <laughs> um, I learned early on in, in contracting, you know, it's, uh, my father-in-law has a, a quote, it's, uh, uh, and I, I don't think he started it obviously, but, uh, it's, you can shear a sheep several times, but you can only skin it once. Right. And so, nice. um, you know, if you're, like you said, the gold fleck eaves, you know, you know, like this is, yeah, this is, this is what they had, you know? So, but yeah, I think, I think as a contractor too, when you're going into an area, unless you have just a ginormous crew, you have to decide, am I going after that neighborhood where we're just going to go bing, 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 and just knock a bunch of these out and try to get everyone in that neighborhood? Or am I going after the big houses? Um, and either way, you can make a ton of money either way, right? You just have to, what's hard is if you're doing both you know, cause that's two different processes, the bing, bing, bing. Um, you know, a lot of times I'm sure you guys have the same thing. Those smaller losses, the utility room, that customer, um, we have one now, you know, there's like a guy that has like a tree through his roof and, and is sleeping on the couch. And he's like, you know, when you get to it, that'll be fine. And then this customer <laughs> has like full in baseboards or something. Right. And they're like, Oh my God, this is such, you know, I don't, right. when is this going to be taken care of? You know, and it's like, man, you have no perspective, you know, to what your neighbors are dealing with, um, you know, in relationship to your damages, we'll get to it. And so, um, I think a lot of that just comes down to what your objectives are, how you want to approach something and, you know, especially in the cat situation, you're talking about contractors that may be coming from out of town. And I think you should talk about that beforehand, right? Are you going to go after the, the bing, bing, bing neighborhoods? Or are you going to go after the high volume neighborhoods? And yeah, it's not a right or wrong. It's just a different strategy. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And I, I see it's interesting on cat. Like if I have a, if I get sent to like, Grand Island, Nebraska, or, you know, Racine, Wisconsin, or something like that, where it's not a very big town. You know, usually it's like yeah. in the little, like the prairie towns where they have 10,000 people in that town. And at the end of the neighborhoods, it's cornfields for a hundred miles in any direction. Sure. Yeah. And I, I've, I've noticed and in, and in being kind of doing a little bit of the contracting briefly, um, contractors don't want to go to those places necessarily because they're like, well, is it going to be worth it? Am I going to be able to make it, you know, whether they yeah. have big houses or small houses. Um, but what happens is as on the adjusting side, when I go to those towns, I love doing that because I, that'll keep me busy all summer easily Yeah, yeah. If for as long as I can yeah. stand it. And there's usually only two or three, maybe four contractors there, maybe one local guy. And then yeah. two people from like, uh, the bigger town that's down the highway, down the interstate yep. and they, they pop over and, you know, do claims and like everybody's getting, getting work from the same contractors. Um, and yeah, in a, in a way, a lot of times the, the homeowners are sitting around waiting to get their roofs done because there aren't as many, there aren't enough contractors. Yeah. Um, yep. so I always look at those as they feel like opportunities. And, but I mean, when you just run it from purely a, a numbers perspective, I think you have to have, like you said, you've really got to have like a, a very strict and very well thought out and very well oiled process in order to yeah. make that go into a smaller market or a little tiny thing place like that, make it worth it. Um, yeah. 
So yeah, man, to you and Cat, I mean, I, I, I did it for 20 years and it's fun. I like doing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, one, of, I mean, one of my favorite parts of it, believe it or not, is negotiating. Huh. Which, and I said, oh, the reason why is because, like I said, I, I write on site. Like I'm, I've, I don't want to do work in my hotel room. I just don't want to yeah. do it. And I find that I can still close seven to nine, you know, roughly a day on a big, big hailstorm in the middle of summer when you got a lot of how daylight. Do you, can I ask you though, how do you do yeah. that? Because one of the biggest problems writing on site is the customer, you know, wants to, well, I was really thinking about tile there, but then <laughs> I don't know, like my neighbor's laminate, you know, so like, um, normally it's try to get as much information as you can on site and then, yeah. If I were to write on site, it would be in the car. Right. You know, well, yeah, that's what I mean. So you have to, it's for for every process, the way I run claims and the way I teach is you have, there has to be distraction free or as few distractions as possible. So if the, if I'm, I can't stand in a homeowner's kitchen with my laptop and try to write an estimate, even if they're not really talking a whole lot because they, they'll say something like, Oh, you know what? I actually forgot. And thought that. And then, or, you know, well, I got to go pick up my kids. How much longer is it going to be? Or whatever. If I go sit in my truck. Or you hear them like, you know, yeah. peeking. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so when I'm yeah. in my truck, then I can like, I can just like yeah. knuckle down on it and just hunch over my laptop yeah. and just, and hammer it out. Um, yeah. So. Um, and then it's but, done, right? It's done. It's done. It's yeah. done. And so if, if there's not yeah. a contractor there, I settle up with the homeowner. Uh, these days yeah. they're, they're doing a lot of like scope and scope or writer programs where you've got to, just somebody goes out and take pictures and does a scope and then they send it off to somebody to write. Somebody and remote. Then, yep. Yep. Um, but they, there's still plenty of tra- more traditional, especially on the daily side, especially with larger losses. Um, so also go settle up with the homeowner. And then I can close the claim when the claim's done. When I go back to my hotel room, I plug my computer in, connect to Wi-Fi, and hit connect and Xactimate or X1 yeah. and just open it, turn it on, and then it'll just upload your files. And they're done. And then my new files come down, you know, and I'll if I got time, I'll call them. Uh, if not, I'll call them in the morning. And then away yeah. we go. But if I have the contractor there, that reduces the chances that I'm going to have to do a reinspection on that loss later. So yeah, my goal, like typically I'll be, um, one of, I'll usually be on like, especially uh, the smaller storms that are kind of, you know, they just, they want to IA on it. Maybe they don't have a, there's no adjuster field adjuster in that territory. So they get a big right. hailstorm in, in Kearney, Nebraska, send a two or three IAs on it. And then maybe one person's left standing three months later. Um, right. If I, if I run a gun and, you know, scope and scope and scope and then sit down and write and guess on some measurements and, I'm, you know, ah, well, you know, I forgot to look at that shed. Ah, well, forget it. You know, and I'll just, whatever. It's coming back up, right? The measurements yeah. are off. I, it's not enough squares. The sh- you know, we forgot to look, the shed's not in the estimate. You said it was going to be in the estimate. You know, if I'm on site with the contractor, then we're going to go through that whole place and we're going to make sure we're both sure. nodding our heads and agreeing. I'm going to write it up. Yep. And th- every time I say it, I'm like, all right, I'm going to go write this one up in the truck. Whoa, what? Really? Whoa. Uh, uh, okay, cool, cool. Uh, all right. Well, I got to make some phone calls. I'll be in my truck. When you're done, man, if you have any questions, I don't know. So they get all excited about it because it's like, th- we're done, right? We're yeah. going to be done in, t- in yeah, yeah. 20 to 30, 30 minutes, whatever. Go write it up. Walk back over to the dude's truck. And, you know, if I printed it out for the insured, I'll hold up the, you know, look at the number and gotta look at it and be like, looks good, man. Like yeah. 99% of the time, because we agreed on every, the scope already, right? And we're both yeah. using Xactimate. Um, so I, I will like to, and I, that's really kind of why I write up on site. And as far as negotiating goes, um, it's an opportunity. I, I feel like to um, get that claim closed anyway. The first, still the first yeah. time, or if it comes up for a reinspection, maybe another adjuster missed some things and they're gone or they didn't, yeah. you know, they, they underwrote it or whatever, for whatever reason, then I can go and I can, I can help with the process because a big part of our job as adjusters 
is, is not just to be like cost control for the insurance company, right? Because we want to, we write it for not a penny more, not a penny less, ideally. Right. But we're still, we're there to help uh, kind of support stick the it relationship. To the contractor. To stick it to the man. Um, <laughs> sure the contractors starve. It's, we're there to, to, to kind of, uphold that relationship between the carrier and their and the, their policyholder, the customer, because they've got a contract, yeah, yeah. right? And so the yep. customer is paying yep. money to the carrier. So if there's an, if there's, if for whatever reason, you know, there's a, maybe a contentious situation and that relationship can be fractured, the carrier wants to keep yeah. that customer no matter what. And they'll pay an extra yeah. $5,000 or $3,000 or, you know, whatever it is if it's reasonable, if it makes sense. And they're like, well, you know, okay, fine. Right. It's a gray area They'll to keep that customer because yeah. that customer, yeah. especially because that customer is a source of referrals, right? They're the, the NPS score thing. When I was working at the, the insurance company, we did the, well, we, they do touch point surveys or whatever, customer service, customer survey, satisfaction surveys for everybody or for most people. And they'll say the number one question they want to ask is, is how likely are you to refer Acme insurance to your friends and family? That's all they want to know. Like, you know, that, there's other questions on there about your experience and how well the adjuster did and all that kind of stuff. But the main, the yeah. big one, the one that you're rated on as an adjuster is, you know, how likely are you to, you know, it's, it's like when you go to the, to get your work done on your truck at the service center and they say, be sure to give yeah. us 10 or, you know, 100s or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, hey, Mr. Insured, how's it going? It's going great today. How are you doing? <laughs> right. This is actually Guy Grant from Veteran Adjusting School. So you want to learn claims from the most experienced veteran adjusters, but you can't find anybody who will let you ride along with them? Then let me tell you about Adjuster TV Plus. Developed by Adjuster TV and its industry partners, including the High End Training Center Veterans Adjusting School in Arizona, Adjuster TV Plus is a growing library of in-depth training videos created just for independent adjusters. Learn scoping and estimating from professional trainers and adjusters. Learn how to handle customer interactions with confidence. Learn the ins and outs of scoping and estimating exterior hail claims. And detailed videos about how to handle smoke, ice dam, water claims, and auto claims. Adjuster TV Plus also features the very best of three years of Adjuster TV's YouTube videos. Educational, entertaining, and inspiring. Come right along with us on Adjuster TV Plus. So it's an opportunity to, for, for, for me to restore some goodwill if it was contentious between those, between the carrier and their customer and to get them whole. Right. So yeah. it's, yeah. so it's, it supports the policy. It supports that relationship. Um, it's not an opportunity to like go out and for a second time, say no to the contractor. I mean, sometimes it happens, you know, because the guy yeah. may be just asking for pie in the sky or, or it's not covered or whatever. Um, but I like to negotiate. I think, I think it's kind of fun, especially when the spirit of that, because when it's a, it's a mindset thing. If you have an attitude where you're like, I'm going to try and, and make sure that this is correct. Right. And I'm going to make sure that this yeah. guy's happy and this guy's happy, which makes them happy and makes that guy, everybody's happy. Um, even if it means I got to like give a little bit over here, um, I'm going to ask him to, to meet me, this contractor, you know, I'm going to say, well, listen, you know, that is that area right there. We, there's nothing I can do on that. You know, um, if later on you can show some documentation that it was absolutely necessary for the job. Sure. 100%. Um, yeah. but that's just, that's out of bounds, whatever it is. Um, but over here on this thing, right. And I'm not going to dwell on like, you know, the six extra feet of, of a uh, drip edge he's got on his estimate where which is $27 yeah. or whatever it is. Cause a lot of adjusters, when they go to negotiate, they're going to get down into the, to the pennies Right. Well, I'm looking at commas. Well, yeah. Right. So I want to yeah. I want to deal with the, the numbers that yeah. that are going to move the needle, and and maybe say you know well I'll tell you what, obviously you guys can't get on the front of this house you know at all. There's a gigantic tree that's blocking the whole thing. You're going to have to carry everything around the backyard. You can't get a truck back there. Here's two thousand bucks for some access. Right. Yeah. Whatever. And then and the guys okay cool. And then there's another, this other little thing. Can't do this. Can't do that. 
nodding head. Okay, we can do it. We yeah. can work with that. We can make it happen. Thank you so much. It's done. Carrier's happy. Insurance happy. The contractor's happy. The desk adjuster down the line, which I was getting the claims like that came up seven months later that, yeah. you know, I was, somebody else did. And I'm trying to like figure out how to negotiate with the contractor through their pictures, right? Like bad pictures. Yep. So yep. any thoughts on negotiating with adjusters on the, on the flip side? Well, we have in, in, in the book, in this uh, really shoddily written uh, book. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. That. I haven't even read it. I know it's awful. Yeah, I, you, you made the right choice. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's the Ten Commandments of, uh, of a Success for Writing and Exactimate. And so exactly like you said, it's, you know, you, now, you, you can never take too many photos, you know, always... Um, F9 notes and then know the carrier's compliance. I guess I wanted to ask you a question. You kind of painted a nice picture. You painted a pretty lofty picture of the adjusting process, right? And the reality is because like um, I've had adjusters. Well, this is a desk adjuster that fought me. We fought for three days. We fought fist, you know, and, and it was back and forth over emails. And I try to be very, you know, okay, you're asking me a question about the claim, you know, did I not clarify that in a line item photo or F9 note, you know, or here's the photo F9 note. Um, and that's a lot of times that's for an adjuster who hasn't gone to the site, like the, a desk adjuster, right. Or a claims reviewer. Yeah. And it ended up being like eight cents difference, you know? And so we've probably got, you know, six hours in interactions and they've got six hours and they saved eight cents, you know? So um, it can be ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I think you're still got to be, you got to be polite. You got to be professional, but don't get played, right? You have to stand your ground. Again, the ground that you should be standing on though, is this is the structure. This is the scope of work. This is the, uh, you know, we're using Xactimate insurance company. We're using your program. Same price list. To. Yeah. And so um, we're differing over how we communicated that. So I, th I think you can still, uh, you know, even that process, I enjoy that process because, you know, anytime the insurance company wants to come back and review the estimate, it's also an opportunity for me to say, oh yeah, you're right there. You caught me, right? I didn't deduct the doors or whatever it was, but I also forgot this, this, and this, you know? So yeah. if you get to reopen it, I also get to reopen it, you know? And so um, so don't be, I guess, don't be, uh, uh, adjusters, desk adjusters, not be surprised that it goes both ways, but what do you, do you feel? Cause there's a lot of contractors that are disenfranchised with the process, right? They feel yeah. insurance companies and some of it's warranted. Some of it, I, sure. I don't know. I just never take it personal, right? Like it's not a personal attack on you. <laughs> like right, right. it's either. Either you can argue for the structure that this is relevant or not. And that we've had, uh, we had one recently, um, like final cleans a line item, right? It's inexact yes. to <laughs> designed to be used, right? And so the insurance company says, well, we don't pay for final clean. Uh, cleanings implied in all of the line items you use. And you go back through all the line items and it's like, there's no cleaning in these line items. So we are going to inform your insured that your insurance company pays for broom finish only. And so Mr. Adjuster, it's now F9 noted in every room, no final clean, broom finish only. And then our contract to the insured, please understand, we're not gonna leave your house a total mess, but we are not taking any extra effort to do cleaning beyond a broom finish because that's what your insurance company pays for, you know? And so I think you can still do that amicably, you know, but, but, you know, when the carrier wants to say that's not in the line or it's included in the line item, no, it's not, you know? And so yeah. um, those are uh, maskings. Another one that's common, yeah, yeah, you know, we're yeah. more interior, you know, that's included in the line item. What a lot of a lot of times the carrier doesn't recognize is so like baseboard before carpet you can install paint and, and install but like laminate or hard surface floors you got to put the floor in first then the base well that's now a legitimate masking item right unless you want me to get paint 
on the new floor, well, it's included in the line item. And I don't, you know, it may have been revised <laughs> now, but that's always been an issue. Contents is another right. one. But so, so on, on your side, what about for new adjusters starting out, uh, not the dark side, but um, you do, you hear about adjusters get beat up by the carriers that they're writing for, right? I mean, you guys are held to the same compliance issues that we are. So a new adjuster thinks they're writing a scope that follows the structure and then they upload it to the carrier and the carrier is like, what is this, you know, rejection, <laughs> you know, revision, right. revision, revision, like you said, and then you're getting called by your supervisor. I think from what I understand, most, um, third party outlets, you usually send it to a reviewer and it's coming back to you before it goes to the carrier. Right. Correct. Um, yep. So what is, what, it, what does that look like for a young adjuster starting out the first time they write an estimate, they think it's awesome. And all of a sudden they're just getting slapped in the face with all the things they did wrong. Well, I mean, that's, that's, by itself, I mean that's a, that's part of the learning process, and I, it, for for most new adjusters, they're required, depending on who they go work for. But if they go work for one of the big, big, big carriers, they're going to have yeah. to get certified first, and so they're going to have to learn. They're going to have to at least have seen the uh, the big part of the estimating guidelines, which is the compliance stuff, right? So, in other words, the twenty two yeah. square feet openings, the you know, no starter, no ridge, you know, it's in the waste, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah, yeah. As an independent adjuster, do you feel like you only have bad, expensive choices for health insurance plans? And when you have to use the insurance, you'll have to pay a lot out of pocket? Makes you wonder why you even have insurance in the first place. The stakes are high. Having no coverage puts you and your family at risk. It doesn't have to be this way. You want peace of mind with common sense health coverage you can count on that doesn't include things you don't need. You need real insurance with world-class protection from established carriers, not health sharing and not cobbled together prepaid medical. And you shouldn't have to wait for it. Get approved in days, not weeks. There is no risk and no cost to see if you qualify for these high quality plans. Not everybody will qualify, but you've got nothing to lose by getting a free consultation. Visit adjustertv.com slash health for more information and to apply. I'm going to be truthful. Well, I'm always going to be truthful, but I think I, I take issue with some of that stuff because I, I feel like a lot of the time um, on the carrier side that they will, they will nickel and dime the smallest things in an effort yeah. to... Um, and this is just theory. This is my theory, but I feel like if there's some like accountant or MBA kid sitting in a cubicle on one of the <laughs> coasts and he's like got a yeah. spreadsheet going and he's running numbers and he's running numbers and he finds a place where the company could save a few million bucks, several million dollars, yeah. uh, you know, or, you know, tens of millions, maybe. Well, yeah, by what's not $100 paying, paying. yeah. Yeah. And by not paying for final cleaning or for this, because it's, you know, it's a gray area. Um, they, they're going to, because the, the profit margins of carriers is like seven or 8%. And it's always, it's that, I mean, that's what it is. Um, they're going to want to try to preserve their profit margin because right? they're a business, right? Um, well, you're saying that's EBITDA, that's earnings after everything else. I mean, their, their top line profit margin is greater than that. No, oh, well, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, but they're going to, if they don't have to pay for it up front, they're not going to, right? Yeah, yeah. If, if they, because well, a lot of times- Some carriers some usually as incurred, and that's that's a fair way to go right. about it. And the reason why they but, do that is because, and I think for, for new adjusters to understand is that, um, as, and, and some contractors, I mean, that I talk to are like, I'm like, listen, I mean, there are contractors out there who won't do that or they don't charge for it, or they just, it's part of the, whatever, they just want the job so bad that they'll do it for what this yeah. estimate is. And so it kind of, it's sort of, everybody's shooting themselves in the foot with it a little bit yeah, all the way around. Exactly. Um, so I say think that new, everybody's shooting say themselves that. in the foot <laughs> yeah. all the way around. So, yeah. you know, and it's, yeah. and it ends up being like, I don't know, it's, it's these, it's kind of the, the marginal, like sort of fringe 
things that, again, when we're going back to negotiating, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm not going to probably even address, unless I absolutely have to, the starter or the masking or the final cleaning or whatever. Yeah. I'm I'm going to focus on this big number. How can we both agree that it's that on this 13,500 or this 25,000, whatever it is, right? Yeah. And we'll both look at that number and not bigger picture because he's like, all right, well, I can get, I can do it all for, for this. It, we'll be able to maintain our profit margin. I can pay my guys. I can pay the, the suppliers. I can, and you know, we're good to go. Um, whereas if we're fighting over, you know, like you said, eight cents for, you know, yeah. the two days worth of work for, for pennies, like actual little, and it happens. Yeah. And I think a, a big part of that is, you know, going back a little bit further is an experience with understanding the actual restoration process, like sure. being able to like, instead of having an abstract idea, looking at estimating guidelines and saying, you know, well, we can't pay for it because it says on its piece of paper, right? Without having actually seen somebody cut a hole in drywall to get the, the wet spot off. Yeah. And then how do you, what's the texture? How does he texture it back on? Do yep. you have to redo all the whole walls? You just, can you just feather it in that one spot? What's the painting look like? Okay. What's this? Yeah, exactly. So exactly. Right. So I, I think that it's, it's inexperience across the board on the, the carrier side, as much as the IA side, because on the carrier side, um, the company that I went and worked for, they put me through four months of, of training. I'd already been an adjuster for like 17 years and my manager, I was like, do I have to attend that training and just start giving me claims? He's like, nah, no, nah, we want to make sure that, you know, you're like kind of in the culture. And it was, it was a good experience. Um, and then see their processes. Right. So, so I know their processes. They didn't, they don't teach construction. They teach estimating yeah. and they teach policy and they teach customer service. Yeah. And they don't sit down and say, all right, here is how specifically how a house is put together. And then here is how, if you're going to replace, you know, the roof, this is how it's, this is what it looks like. They'll explain yeah. it in abstract terms. So a person has an abstract idea in their mind and they're not really, you know, which is why a lot of desk adjusters don't know how to do roof claims or a lot of yeah. uh, local like staff adjusters because they don't do a lot of hail or they have never done hail before. Then they may, maybe they do like a few shingles here and there, blown, you know, for wind claims. Yeah they're doing all fire and water claims, right? They're not doing a lot yep. of roofs. And so in the meetings that we'd have, it would come up about roofs it, when I was working at the the carrier and I was the only guy in the meeting of 10 people that had replaced roofs and had replaced thousands of them, you know, in, in estimates. Yeah. And so they would ask me, they'd say, Matt, so, you know, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what we can expect, you know, we had a wind event and wherever, whatever state, and we're going to be all getting a bunch of this overflow work, you know, let's talk about repair versus replace. Let's talk about slopes versus total, um, you know, and make sure that we're calibrated and we're doing the right thing. And they don't always have yeah. the, the benefit of having somebody who knows roofs, you know, so it's, I think w when we're, that this, this is all kind of the complexity that we're dealing with on both sides is that, you have a lot of people that don't have experience or there's mixed experience with, you know, or mixed yeah. knowledge as far as understanding how things go together. And then fear for new people, a lot of times they're, they're going to be afraid to spend the insurance company's yeah. money. So they'll underwrite everything like severely. Yeah, exactly. They're like, well, I don't yeah. know. I, you know, they're, they're, they're confused about, you know, what, what the purpose of depreciation is for. So they may sit, look at something and say, well, it looks really old, so I can't pay for it at all. Right. What all they need to do is just yeah, depreciate yeah. it. Um, so then yeah. they underwrite everything. And that's where the, the blood and the water thing comes in with the, the homeowner being like, you don't know what you're doing. You know, I need an adjuster yeah, yeah. who does. And they're calling their agent and they're yelling. Um, yeah. So I can't remember what your question was, but yeah, to answer it, that's what it is. Well, I think, I think to, you know, uh, contractors and adjusters too, we talked about the final clean, you know, sometimes you can ask an adjuster, they could say, you know, Hey, specifically final clean is on the red list, right? But I can give you two or three hours of cleaning labor in the general conditions or something like that. So I remember I had a contractor, <laughs> they had, uh, they went in and did demo for another mitigation contractor. And I can't remember, it was something like, 
it was basically like a $150 line item. The, the carrier, the adjuster they were working with wouldn't approve. It was either the, the dispatch call or something like that, but they paid everything as like cat three and after hours, every line item. Right. And I was like, man, I said, I go, and then they were fairly new to the, to working with Xactimate. I said, you're upset over $150 this adjuster has approved something that they normally wouldn't approve for most contractors. Normally they'd have you use regular labor line items. And then maybe they give you an after hours dispatch, which gives you another $30 or something like that. So this adjuster is actually giving you something in industry standards, really fair. And so I would take it and shut up about the $150. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Which goes back to what you were saying is, you know, look at the the bigger picture, you know, on both sides, you know, so yeah. it's, uh, and I think that's, if, if you weren't um, on our side, if you're a new contractor and you're in the, not the wrong social media channels, but you're getting influenced by people that are fight, fight, fight people. Yeah. Um, you know, something like that seems like, well, this is atrocious. This is, we had to dispatch, you know, and it's like, yeah, but you don't understand overall, they've given you a pretty fair scope, you know, and you, and you've netted a lot more. So I think it is important, you know, stuff like you guys are doing with adjuster TV, helping people get out there, having a network of people that you can bounce ideas off of. Be careful too. I think that's one of the biggest things I talk about in the book is, you know, form your own opinions, you know, so take everything you hear with a grain of salt. So if someone's on the extreme of this is terrible, it sucks. And someone's on the extreme of, man, you're going to be a millionaire by tomorrow, you know, kind of take those with a grain of salt and listen to the guys that have had, you know, I've got a couple of scars, but I've had some victories and we're feeding my family. You know, those are the people that you want to kind of model yourself after and uh, figure out how to carve out a career because, you know, not every day's fun, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There are days that just kick, kick, kick you in the shorts and, uh, but overall, I mean, what I love about the industry is it's always something new, right? You know, there's always a new challenge, whether it's a new person or the structure's different or oh yeah, uh, I'm sure you even see that with hail, right? Even though hail is fairly similar, like, dang, I've never seen a hail do that, you know? So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, so. It's a, it's a, I think it's an imperfect system all the way around. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's got people in it and we're not perfect. So I, I think, uh, I, it's having a, having a good mindset about it. And like you said, you know, taking stuff with the grain of salt, like I said, I mean, I even tell people for, for my training, I'm like, listen, I'm going to show you how to, to, to do stuff so that you can survive your first cat deployment, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. take that and go, you know, launch off in your own yeah. direction to take it, you know, and figure out your own thing, you know, take pieces of it, get rid of all of it, whatever. But as long as you have your own system um, and you understand the big picture, then you're going to do fine, I think, you know, either way. So if if people are interested in finding more information out about you and what you do, um, kind of tell us where we can go. Don't do it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The Diojo is probably the best spot. Uh, The is spelt T H E. Um, and then Diojo is D-Y-O-J-O.com. Um, and then same, it's Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube. We got the YouTube forward slash the Diojo. We have a podcast every th- Thursday. Uh, we release some content in the mornings and um, got the books, you know, here. You can help uh, supplement uh, my family, me feeding my family by buying these mediocre books. And then they're great for like starting fires, you know, um, you can put it in your, <laughs> your escape pack, you know, yep, so yep. if your desk is out of level, you know, just slide the book <laughs> under there. Cool. Well, thanks so. a lot for, for, uh, for joining us here. Um, I think this is, uh, some good, some good content, some good information that adjusters are really going to benefit from. And awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to keyword it to roofers as well. Cause I think that, you know, I think it's a great conversation to see two people who have got experience talking about, the process and seeing both yeah. sides of it and kind of being able to get their their brains wrapped around that big picture so thanks a yeah. lot man i really appreciate well, it thank you thank you yeah. for reaching out i uh, um you know definitely 
um, the content and the way that you put it out and the value you bring to the industry. We always try to encourage people, you know, understand both sides. It sounds like you're on the same uh, wavelength. So uh, appreciate what you're doing and for inviting me onto your Adjuster TV. So no problem. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV. So yep. very cool, man. Listen, let's uh let's let's uh if anybody has uh I'm gonna edit this out because I just lost my train of thought. Shut up a dubba dubba dubba. Speaking of yet, so. <laughs> <laughs>